My name's Fiona Braithwaite and I'm from Homes England. I'm delighted to welcome you to our Winter Learning Programme. This offers a series of knowledge sharing sessions on topics you've told us are of interest to you. And today's event is focused on sustainable urban drainage systems for housing development and regeneration sites. So the Winter Learning Programme is brought to you by Homes England's Local Government Capacity Centre. This slide summarises who the Local Government Capacity Centre are and what our mission is. We established the centre following extensive research and consultation with you across local government and with a whole range of other partners to determine where authorities most need support and how this could best be delivered. Next slide, please. The learning programme is just one of the tools offered by the Local Government Capacity Centre. Our offers also include the Housing Information Hub, an index of professional housing resources accessible via gov.uk, and fact sheets to support local authorities with a case for housing development and regeneration and a capacity analysis tool. So on the agenda on the screen, you should hopefully see a breakdown of today's session. Um, Adrian Baudremont from Syria, the Construction Industry Research and Information Association, will provide an introduction to SUDS. This will be followed by Chris Patmore, a technical director specialising in SUDS from consultancy WSP, and his colleague Andrew Wilkinson is also at the session today. And Chris will provide an introduction to Schedule 3 and the SUDS approving body and what it will mean for planners and developers. Adrian will then finish with some useful tools and guidance, and then we'll finish with a question and answer session, and the session will be drawn to close with some further polls to get some immediate feedback and any ideas for future learning session content. I'm now going to hand over to our first presenter, Adrian Baudremont from Syria. Thank you Thanks, so Adrian. much. Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you, Fiona. Can you all see the slide? Yes, looks like it's the correct one on, on, on the screen. So my name is Adrian Baudremont. I'm a research manager at Syria. And now uh, I will be uh, giving a short introduction on what sustainable drainage systems are. Um, so let's start with the next slide, please. So very shortly, who is Syria? So we are the uh, Construction Industry Research and Information Association, and we are a not-for-profit member-based organization. And we want to improve the performance of uh, the environmental themes within the construction industry. And we want to do that through providing information and uh, good practice guidance documents. We provide guidance, but also training courses, award and networking opportunities. Next slide, please. You can see here on screen a little snapshot of our membership. Uh, we are reaching very wide within the construction industry from tier one contractors, consultants, but also the academia um, and um, uh, public entities. Next one, please. Here you can see the outputs uh, that we are working towards the most famous ones are our guidance documents so here you can see on the screen i just add a couple of those there's the search manual i'll be talking about this one a little bit more later uh, the natural flood management manual and uh, there's also one on biodiversity net gain but there are many 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 uh, guidance documents so this is like our main output we also provide trainings uh, which i will be describing a little bit later on we have networking opportunities for our members and for um, stakeholders, which include annual lectures, debates, and awards. Um, the awards are a mean of showcasing good practice within the industry. We also have a series of dedicated topic-specific groups um, that are communities of practice. The most uh, uh, the most famous one is Sustrain, the Community for Sustainable Drainage, and I will be talking a little bit more about this one later on. We also have one on build of sites, one around the management of soil, and one around biodiversity within the construction industry. Lastly, we are also providing tools. Um, the latest one is Syria Best, which is a benefit estimation tool, which I will be talking about um, a little bit later as well. Next slide, please. All right, I'm gonna start with a quick one-on-one -on -one introduction about sustainable drainage systems. Um, from the poll, from the very beginning of this presentation, uh, it seems like you are all aware of what these are, but uh, maybe not so much in the detail. So I'm gonna 
just do a very simple introduction to um, to 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 tell you about the basics of what does uh, this philosophy, what these principles are. Next one, please. All right. First of all, I just want to give you a little bit of a of a snapshot of what we're talking about throughout the catchment. Um, and I'm insisting on the catchment uh, word because ideally any surface water management should be seen as a, a catchment based vision encompassing not only the urban areas, but also the rural and uh, making sure that the whole catchment area has interactions, uh, sorry, interventions to um, catch the water, slow it, spread it, sink it, uh, all the good things that we are promoting through SERP. So here you can see the usual suspects, green roofs, uh, wetland, tree pits. You can see uh, permeable paving, rain gardens, etc., etc., and bioswales. Everything that is a means to catch the water where it falls and to um, slow it, spread it, uh, and try to, to treat it on site. Next slide, please. Now, on the, um, the rural side of surface water management, this is the uh, natural flood, um, the natural flood management. And uh, I will come back to this slide a little bit later as I will be talking about some of the NFM measures. But uh, here you can see as well, uh, this is all about the runoff management. Um, so, uh, you know, the um, the leaky barriers and uh, and things like that to really uh, trap the water where it is, slow it and use it as much as possible. Next slide, please. All right, a little bit of the concept uh, behind surface words, uh, behind sets. So a little bit of a, if, if we look back at uh, our um, growing societies, so back in the days, surface water in urban areas were seen as a nuisance. And the main goal uh, was to push this water away as fast as possible. And we would do that through uh, piping the water out. And we would do that by also burying it uh, away from site and uh, hoping that you know the water would just be, uh, be uh, moved elsewhere very quickly. <clears throat> of course, um, as more and more development happens, the risk of flooding increased as well. As you can imagine, uh, the more we move the water downstream as quickly as possible, the more there's a risk downstream actually for more flooding. Also, um, in combined sewers, um, areas where there's combined sewers, more addition to the, the sewer network is actually a risk to the treatment capacity, and that could lead to um, combined sewer overflows and other uh, very risky and uh, and unwanted consequences. Here on screen, you can see that the main goal is to manage the water close to source, which is the source control aspect, trying to catch it where it falls and uh, trying not to move it really far, but um, try to, uh, to treat it on site pretty much. We like to think of set catchment, so even though Ideally, we would think of surface water management as a catchment-based approach. Um, the breakdown of the water that falls on site into a series of sub-catchment and a series of sets is actually really good because it helps slowing down, uh, removing pollutant by trapping sediments, and uh, avoiding that this water ends up into a pipe and later on either downstream or into the sewage uh, network. The goal is also to treat the everyday rainfall um, to try to completely disconnect this uh, input of water from the rest of the network. Um, all right, next one, please. Here on screen, you can see the uh, four pillars of sustainable drainage systems. And these are the, the main ones that, of course, we are, you know, we're most familiar with is the water quantity. So this is really to support the management of flood risk. And uh, the other one is the water quality. As I mentioned, uh, using vegetated surfaces helps trap sediments and allows for um, the, the sediments to not move downstream and end up into uh, rivers or, or other parts of the site. 
So it's really about slowing the water where it falls. The amenity part of it is really to create and sustain better, better places to live and to work. Um, so it's really an opportunity to create um, a very beautiful place that can have multiple benefits uh, and that can serve the community that lives there. Lastly, biodiversity is a very critical one. Um, of course, we're, we are in the, in the middle of a biodiversity crisis. Uh, but there is a lot happening in this domain uh, these days with biodiversity net gain uh, becoming mandatory for all new sites in a couple of weeks. So it's, uh, it's also another opportunity to actually add on to the existing biodiversity uh, through sets. Next one, please. If we dive a little bit uh, deeper into those principles, the first one, as I mentioned, is really to see the water runoff not as a nuisance that we try to push downstream somewhere else and that we don't want to see. It's actually to keep it on the surface where it's easily visible, accessible, and where we can actually use it for more than just, um, you know, uh, catching the water. So it is um, the idea of using natural drainage as much as possible, so uh, soil infiltration, and uh, it's really about slowing the, the system and providing multiple such trains uh, to really catch this water and use it. The water quality, as I mentioned, um, capturing sediments and pollutants through the root systems and through the different components that make uh, sustainable urban drainage. Next one, please. Amenity, uh, definitely maximize multifunctionality. So this could be traffic calming, like trippets used on the side of the roads to slow down the traffic. It could be uh, using uh, those for play area, for playgrounds, for example. And um, it's also just to make you know the, uh, the place a more beautiful one uh, with more greenery in it. The biodiversity, as we mentioned, is really critical, and uh, hopefully, you know, a network of suds will provide this habitat connectivity that uh, most of our species actually really need in urban area. Next one, please. Okay, some of the delivery principles that we have is really to start engaging uh, earlier, as early as possible, uh, between developers, local authorities, designers, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It's a multidiscipline um, kind of activity, and it's really important to start it as early as possible. So one of the the key things is um, once sustainable drainage systems have been really taken account from the early design stages. Then uh, this would be this will be delivered throughout the process, and this is how you obtain some very multi beneficial sets. It is possible to integrate art and soft components uh, with a mix of surface uh, vegetated sets, but also buried components. So there's always uh, a mix to be done here, um, but of course we would say that you know it's always good to keep the water on the surface as much as possible. This, this, this will help with the maintenance as well, and of course, for the, the visibility of it. Next one, please. Um, this is my last slide for this very short introduction on what sets are. This is a summary of the benefits that they can provide. And um, as you can see, throughout the catchment, they can provide a lot of um, things that the uh, that, that urban, you know, that communities are really looking forward to. So you can see in blue the four pillars of sets with biodiversity, amenity, flood risk management, and water quality improvements. But of course, uh, you can see, you know, the education the opportunities with sets in school. We have more and more of those, which is great. Increase in property value, uh, those create beautiful places to live. Um, but also, you know, uh, air quality with more green in urban spaces. Uh, enhance the quality of urban space, health and well-being, as we know, is key uh, to, to access green spaces uh, where we live and work. And, um, and also the, uh, the, the, it, it helped with the, the heat effect island uh, that we have in dense urban cities. So 
I'm going to stop here and uh, next slide, please. I'm going to pass it on to Chris. Um, and then I will come back after Chris' presentation to talk a little bit more about some of the tools that are available for developers and uh, local authorities when it comes to planning and uh, delivering SIS. Thank you so much. Thank you, Andrew. Um, hopefully you can hear me. And um, yeah, sorry about the uh, technical questions that we uh, issues that we've got at the moment. Um, <clears throat> what I'm um, like to talk about and uh, I do apologize in advance if it's a little bit rushed, but then perhaps we can answer some questions uh, afterwards. But um, so Adrian sort of set out the principles of SUDS, um, Schedule 3 and the SUDS approving bodies, these SABs, is the mechanism to get that widely adopted in new development and in any sort of retrofitting scenario. So next slide, please. So where we are at the moment, and this is sort of the legal sort of status, is that this time a year ago, uh, the government announced that in England they were going to enact Schedule 3 of the Flood and Water Management Act 2010. So the Act has been kicking around for well over a decade now. Um, and Schedule 3 is basically the mechanism where we will will gain an adopting and maintaining an approving body that will mandate SUDS into new development. So this has already happened in Wales for the last few years. Um, and it, the idea is that it, it will then apply to the rest of England. So what I'd like to talk about in the next um, sort of half an hour or so is, is how that is looking, what the state of play is. The announcement last year was su was suggesting that it would be implemented this year. Um, our advice at the moment is that that's still potentially the case, although we're already sort of uh, you know heading for Fe February. Uh, next slide, please. So I'd like to do it in in two two parts. So one, the first part is you know what is what is Schedule Three, what is a SAB. Um, and then what is the background, the technical information that's available now, um, and how is that process uh, going to be taken forward? Next slide. So uh, the government's undertaken uh, many reviews and they're continuing to take reviews in the on the implementation of Schedule 3. Um, and the whole concept within the Flood and Water Management Act is to ensure that SUDs are designed to assist not only with uh, the impact of flooding to new developments, but they will also have that four pillars that was mentioned earlier, um, work with biodiversity, with amenity, with water quality. Um, and as I say, expected sometime this year. Next slide, please. So as part of this, the likely structure is that the SAB, or the SUDS approving body, will be an entity that will work within um, councils, county councils, unitary councils, uh, and they'll sit alongside the lead local flood authority. Um, some will have some commonality between the two, um, but the idea is that they are, they are not a replacement to the lead local flood authority, they work alongside. And they will be responsible for approving suds design drainage design right from the start of any project so that will be from the concept right through to the uh, outline planning detail planning uh, construction design construction and maintenance next slide now one of the reasons that it's got a bit more traction of late is um, and you've seen a lot of this in the press uh, there's been various angles about uh, water quality management, um, there's a biodiversity net gain parameters, um, but there are a lot of a lot of things with the water network as it is at the moment, which are a cause con con of concern. And as I say, lots of studies have been done. One recent study done for DEFRA last year, uh, year before last, um, suggested that SUDS is a way of helping to assist in tackling combined sewer overflow issues, for instance. Um, as well as capacity issues in drainage networks um, and as well as the flooding and various other bits. Uh, next slide, please. So in parallel to the Flood and Water Management Act, there's a lot of other guidance and other 
um, documents that apply to different parts of, of our industry that are all heading in the SUDS uh, way. And these include things like the next iteration of the manual for streets, which will have um, much more emphasis on uh, getting that street scene, combining that with the drainage rather than hiding the drainage. So there'll, there'll be an element of SUDS within the manual for streets. We've already seen the sewer sector guidance come out in 2020, which uh, embedded some SUDS, not, not all elements of SUDS, but some SUDS within the framework that could be adopted by a water company. Um, this is still filtering through the system, um, but it is a big step forward in um, employ making SUDS as the natural and first choice for a drainage solution. Um, and as I say, there's other documents that have been issued by the likes of the um, uh, Central uh, Infrastructure Commission and various others that are suggesting that we need to tackle the issues that we've got with, with flooding by more SUDs. Next slide. So what does Schedule 3 actually mean? So as I said, we're, it's the setting up of the SUDs approval bodies and that these bodies are involved in all aspects of drainage design and master planning right from the start, in line with the principles let, uh, set out by Adrian a bit earlier. They will apply to all new developments, and the, de the definition is still being discussed, but it's likely that it will be, uh, it will wrap up things like permitted developments as well, and some minor developments. It will be mandatory for the adoption of surface water schemes to be adopted by the SAP, not the water company, but the SAP. But they must um, comply with the SUDS requirements, which we'll run through in a little bit. There may be some exceptions. Now in Wales, um, they currently um, apply the, the SAP approval process to anything greater than uh, or equal to 100 square meters. And if you can envisage 100 square meters, that's about the footprint of, a, of an average house. Um, so it's quite a small area. So at the moment, the lead local flood authority would get involved when you're talking about 10 units, 10 dwellings or more. Um, the, there's a potential for the SAP to get involved in even smaller types of development. That's still under review. Under review. Um, National, uh, nationally significant infrastructure projects and trunk roads, they are potentially going to be exempt um, because they're covered by different acts and different procedures. Um, but other highway works will be within the SAP approval and this will change some um, highway management aspects and some 278 works, some section 38 works will be uh, embedded within the SAP process, which is a slightly different than uh, the than present. Next slide. Right, so we're basing most of this on the Welsh experience and the government is using the Welsh experience as a sort of test bed uh, for good and, and bad practice, uh, what could be uh, improved. Now, one of the things, uh, and it's probably particularly for yourselves, is that some of your projects are quite large. They have long lead in times, they have long development times, they could be multiple um, phases, stages. Um, so how would you um, apply Schedule 3? Would you come straight in and it applies to everything or does it do it in stages? So it's a likely that there will be a transitional arrangement in that, you know, if you're, if you're significantly progressed through planning already or you've got your outline planning permission, then some of your reserve matters may be um, exempt some of your reserve matters if they drag on for a long time would would then have to introduce schedule three processes um, when they come to be um, discharged so there's so phasing needs to be looked at for the bigger developments uh, next page please so at the moment um, there is a document called the non-technical um, ten standards for suds um, these are non-statutory, um, which means that, that they have some uh, credence, but um, are not mandatory at the moment. 
but they are sort of de facto applied in many uh, lead local flow authorities at the moment. But from the list uh, in front of you, hopefully you can um, see the list. They concentrate on peak flow control and peak volume control or, or volume control. And this is primarily the flood risk management in the four pillars. There's very little discussion on water quality. There's very little discussion on amenity uh, and biodiversity. So the standards need to be upgraded. The next slide, please. So as part of the review of the implications of Schedule 3, the, those technical standards, which will then become mandatory, will be enhanced and include a number of additional items and, new, and sections. Um, I've highlighted a few of them here. So uh, surface water designation, which is basically, you know, where does that, where does your surface water go uh, when it rains? So in line with what Andrew Adrian was talking about earlier, the, the source control type process, then this hierarchy, which is available in building regs and uh, serial manual and a few other documents, will become much more um, utilised and it, you'll need to di demonstrate that you are applying the hierarchy in the order that it is written. So why I uh, you know, use it, reuse it, recycle is like the first port of call. Uh, infiltration, which is losing it uh, into the ground at the source or close to where it falls and then only then passing it on to water bodies or, or sewers as a last resort. So that, that becomes enshrined into the standards. Uh, Adrian also mentioned this idea of everyday rainfall, which may be a, a new concept to uh, drainage engineers in that most of the time they're designing for peak rainfall, um, worst storm event type criteria with climate change, et cetera. Um, but a lot of SUDS features um, look at and can deal with everyday rainfall which is about 95% of every time it rains. And the idea is that if, if you've got a green blue type infrastructure, that rainfall could be lost, whether it's infiltration or trans evaporation with the plants or, to, or uptake with the plants and that, but you, you actually take that water out of the system and that could have uh, impacts on giving you increased capacity in um, surcharge systems downstream. Water quality, that will be enhanced and uh, made more of a focus within the, the standards. Next slide, please. Uh, and again, there will be more guidance on amenity and biodiversity within these standards, which should run parallel to, say, the net biodiversity, net gain um, legislation, which is coming out in a couple of weeks' time, etc. cetera. Um, and then, as before, there'll be updates on uh, design and construction, operation and maintenance in line with the SAB being the, the body that takes on this responsibility. Next slide. So this, the SAB, as I sort of hinted at, will be um, within the process right from the beginning. So from the planning and the pre-app right through to the, the design, the build and the maintenance. So this is a, a lot different from the lead local flood authority who may get involved in the, the planning and the uh, planning application stage, but then may not ever see the, the development um, again until something goes wrong later on. So this SAM process consolidates everything into a single body, a single um, authority that will look through the entire life cycle of your drainage network. And as I say, this takes it um, away uh, from water companies in uh, certain developments or most developments coming forward. Um, so you don't get that two two stage element, which is one of the reasons why it's been brought in, is that you might get a lead local flood authority that has agreed a suds based drainage solution, but then when it's offered for adoption, um, then all of the criteria change, uh, all the, all of the design standards change because they have to meet the the water company's uh, aspirations and um, design criteria. So the whole idea of the SAB is to bring all of that together. So what is looked at planning and pre-app is carried forward to detail, design, build, uh, construction and maintenance. Um, and I see from the chat, there's lots of comments about, you know, how is this actually going to be brought forward and the complications that go with it. Next slide, please. So 
this is a a, a, a sort of simplified flowchart. Um, so the, this there's there's two ways to to go about the SAB process, um, similar to uh, applying for um, drainage consent from a water company, in that you can you can have it as a standalone application um, outside of the planning system. Um, so that's called the free freestanding one, um, but you go to the SAB rather than the water company. Um, but probably the most common will be it runs alongside planning because it's integrated with your master planning, it's integrated with the detailed design um, uh, and and how they work in conjunction. Um, and then you'll, you'll get your uh, approvals and um, in the same way as the water company ones, if you do not get approval from a SAB, you cannot construct that drainage, um, which then has uh, knock on effects to your uh, deliverability um, of the whole uh, master plan. So this embedded embeds the SUDs within the master plan and the idea being that they are becoming an intrinsic part of the scheme uh, going forward. Next slide, please. Right, so what does it mean? And I can see from the chat, there's lots of um, uh, comments about um, various things coming forward. Um, so next slide, please. What it means is that developers are going to have to look at drainage a little bit more um, upfront than currently um, they might be sort of doing. And I, I certainly personally have found that uh, even though the Schedule 3 is not up and running yet, there are local authorities and lead local flood authorities that are beginning to incorporate a lot of the processes within the SAB uh, process, within Schedule 3. Um, so you might find that there's more checklists to, to fill in at early stages. There's more definition on amenity and biodiversity and water quality in your applications than perhaps the the national um, standards would would suggest you need to comply with. So next slide, please. So uh, your pre-application consultation. So this should be running alongside your planning and your master plan development. And the the level of information um, is going to be slightly more than than you perhaps would have done previously, in that you you would be looking at some. Uh, site investigation works, not necessarily intrusive ones, but ideally intrusive ones. A bit more on topography, site levels, um, a bit more on ecology. So so rather than sort of a, an initial pre-app where you might just go in and say, well, I've got a red line. This is kind of what we're going to do uh, with this kind of volume and this flow rate. You're going to be asked a lot more in-depth questions about who owns the watercourses, who owns the, the land. Um, what rights have you got? Um, what is your conceptual scheme, etc.? And of course, there'll be some charges um, applicable to this. The £250 sort of quoted there is based on on the Welsh uh, experience. Um, again, that's not been um, uh, defined as yet. Um, but as I say, there's a bit more information that you need to have up front to uh, define your drainage network and also confirm that it's it's going to be feasible and we'll we'll cover that a little bit later but there are some changes in in this uh this whole concept is to have much more of a uh, integrated sud solution rather than um what's commonly referred to as an end of pipe solution uh, we'll cover that in, in in a little bit next slide please so the detailed sub -sub submission uh, this is the one that is it's very it's similar to a water um, company application, but you are now um, adding it into the drainage authority and the lead local flood authority, and you're tying the, all of these in with your master planning. So it is a very similar app uh, set of information. You need more environmental, you need more landscaping, you need uh, geotechnical information, you need maintenance and construction impacts to be looked at. Um, and there's also the the fees um, and bonds, et cetera, that go with um, passing the drainage to another authority. Next stage, please. So this is a long list, and sorry if, if, you, can, if you can't see all the elements of it, um, but this is basically a sort of a checklist 
of the sorts of things that you will be asked to submit at your detail um, submission. So many of these will be the normal sort of um, uh, drainage information um, and also very similar to what you would normally be required to submit to a, a drainage authority such as cross sections, long sections, standard details, um, catchment drawings, sub catchment drawings, um, you need details of the water quality treatment, pollution prevention, um, how the landscaping works. So your drainage solution, because of being a blue-green solution, will have, have an element of landscaping entrenched into the solution. Um, and also information on the construction, the health and safety, um, and your consents and permissions that you might need. So these may include, if you're altering watercourses, et cetera, that you might need to have uh, ordinary watercourse consent or uh, flood management consent, et cetera, et cetera, for outfalls, those kind of stuff. And ownership. Ownership is key because um, that information will then get passed down to the adopting authority to let them know who owns which bit of the assets that you're transferring. Um, maintenance schedules, and you might already have had this with applications where the Lead Local Flood Authority has been asking for maintenance schedules. Um, this will become uh, fairly standard that every application will need to highlight how things are maintained, how often they're maintained and how uh, and who by. Next slide. Um, so, um, different from perhaps the Lead Local Flood Authority, the SAB will then take this further in that they will be looking at the construction element of it as well. There will be inspectors, um, clerk of works, etc., that will be looking at that to ensure that the construction is in line with the approved um, documents, the, the approved designs. So, again, similar to water companies. Um, within the council remit. So these will be quite complicated because they won't be just looking at whether or not you've got a pipe that connects point A to point B or whether you've installed a hydro break or not. These will be looking at whether or not your infiltration basin has been compacted by too much plant, etc. Um, so it's a lot more um, in-depth and a lot more uh, aspects to it. Um, uh, next slide, please. So the um, when you know once you've constructed these things, the SAB is then obliged if everything is in line with with how it's been designed and built, that they then become the adopting or adopting body, and they will look at uh, taking over the operation. So you so you will find you'll have a development which has no surface water adopted by a water company. Um, that's not to say that the final outfall may connect to um, an existing asset, Anglian Water, Thames, you know, whoever. Um, but within the development itself, it will be within SAB adoption. There will be some exceptions and similar to um, the Water Act, etc. the exceptions basically resolve around um, single dwellings, um, whether that's uh, a school or an office block uh, or a single house or a block of flats where they still remain as a private network connecting to uh, another uh, network. Now, timing, and I think from some of the, the chat links that are going through, is going to be an issue um, because uh, bringing all the drainage forward into the sort of arena of seeking planning permission is going to mean that there's perhaps some some knock-on effect on timing in terms of delays in getting the approvals or the the SAB um, process up and running. Um, that is something that um, DEFRA and the government are looking at um, because that does need a large uh, resource um, and the whole planning system to, to be joined up. Uh, next slide, please. So, uh, it's sort of hinted that there there is going to be likely costs. Uh, again, these are based on Welsh uh, costs at the moment. Um, so there's application fees, uh, similar to planning application fees based on site area. Um, so they could they could increase um, from any sort of number based on this. There's the consultation uh, costs. There's the costs for having the inspectors come out uh, and do the the site 
visits. Um, and then, of course, there's, there's things like performance bonds. Um, but then it comes to long-term maintenance. So I know everybody's question when they, they talk about um, a different body taking over the drainage is um, who's going to maintain it and fund it and how is that funding arranged? Um, so at the moment, um, the sort of suggested mechanism is commuted sums and the model that um, DEFRA have been looking at in order to uh, determine what those are to try and get some sort of level playing field between all the all the potential SABs is the um, ADEPT model methodology, uh, which uh, I don't know if, if many of you are, um, are familiar with that. Um, but that's trying to make a level and that's uh, make a level playing field. And that is one of the things that having this SAB um, and Schedule 3 uh, in place is trying to achieve as well. So that one authority is not applying the, the standards in a different way to another. Uh, next slide, please. So um, as I say, they've, they've in effect trialed this in Wales for a little bit. And there are there are some issues that has been highlighted and uh, experience. And, and I think these sort of mirror some of the questions that have been put forward on the chat. Um, because SUDS is a multidisciplinary solution, um, some uh, technical deficiencies have been sort of observed within SAB offices in that not all of them are technically um, trained in all aspects of SUDS. And, and it's quite, um, you know, it's quite a wide ranging topic. You could, you could be more geotechnically faced rather than landscaping, um, biodiversity, etc. Um, so there are some issues with the training. Um, the guidance in Wales as well was observed that although there was um, sort of the, the statutory mandatory standards, there was not, an, not enough information backing those up. Um, and that is something that um, DEFRA um, needs to look at in that the information is not just you shall provide amenity but how do you provide it and what does it mean those kind of things um, there's also been a lot of movement um, of sab officers um, from and when the lead local flood authorities uh, in terms of um, attrition rates etc where they've been moving from sabs to consultants um, uh, back again and from wales to different parts of the country um, so there are some issues with uh, staff retention on there. Next slide. So uh, I sort of hinted that um, the idea of Schedule 3 is that the whole drainage design from concept through to construction is one process and one team. Um, and that works on both sides. So on the on the SAB side, it would be ideal if the officers that looked at the pre-app were the same officers that carry, carry the scheme through. Um, and also on the developer side, that it's the same team that carries it through and you don't have a disconnect between the planning application design and the detail uh, design and then the construction design if you have like, uh, design and build or something. Um, it's to try and smooth those out so you, you end up with the concept um, into uh, construction. Um, Timescales. Um, there are some gaps in the Welsh system in terms of time timeframes, and timeframes will be one of those things that um, everybody will want to know how uh, that works with the planning system in England. Um, and communication uh, is always about communication, and because again, uh, SANS is a multidisciplinary uh, solution, you may have some issues with the county landscaping team, for instance, or the highways team um, having some discrepancy with uh, what the SAB team is, is seeking or what the developer is seeking. Um, so those are all, and in, in, in a way, some of those are, are could be predicted, could be sort of fairly um, very obvious, um, but they are things that need to be tackled before Schedule 3 is rolled out to the rest of England and we we create another 152 potential uh, SAB bodies that everybody has to deal with. Uh, next slide. Uh, so at the moment, it's all the suggestion is that it's uh, a seven-week process, um, but that has got to 
um, that has got to tie in with and and look at the planning, but how where that sits within planning. Um, but of course, you're always going to get the case. Well, you're not always going to get the case, but you might get the case where the initial um, application doesn't meet the standards, um, and then there'll be this consultation process where it it needs to go back in for submission. It has to be redesigned, uh, uh, etc. And that is slightly different from the process in the planning system. So that's something that needs to be looked at. Uh, next slide, please. So um, another issue, and this is you know partly why we're doing this presentation and, and similar presentations, is that um, developers don't seem to be drawn into this process too well. Uh, and I've certainly found that a lot of developers are not really knowing what this process is, when it's coming in, what it means to them. Um, and all of a sudden they'll start getting applications refused and being asked for lots of additional bits of information and, and other bits of pap paperwork to be completed um, and that causes them delays. So uh, dissemination of information is, is going to be key to get, getting Schedule 3 to be widely taken on board um, without causing a lot of teething, teething problems in the, um, in the beginning. Um, and as I say, a lot of people are talking about timeframes. Uh, next slide, please. So what we're, I'm just going to summarize this up because it's, it's time to move on to the next bit. Um, so if, if we had an application now and an outline planning application, uh, and we were looking at complying with the uh, non statutory standards at the moment, you know, in effect, you could just state you need to provide X cubic meters of attenuation and discharge at Y liters a second uh, to meet Q bar or greenfield runoff rates. And, and technically that meets the standards that we've got at the moment, but it doesn't feature all these other aspects. So next slide. So what you would have to do is go to the next level was, was how is your treatment work? How do you apply water quality? Um, how do you deal with the everyday rainfall that was mentioned before? Um, that means that you might have to provide more more information on levels, uh, long sections, and perhaps capacity of, of the network. So all of these things are being brought forward uh, in the system. Uh, next slide, please. But ultimately, so and sort of in conclusion, the the image on the on the left is one that I took. Um, uh, I'll say somewhere in Norfolk, but I won't say where. Um, and that is an attenuation basin uh, from a road. And it does exactly what the requirements were when that was constructed, which was it attenuates a volume and discharges at a given flow rate. Uh, it's also fenced in, uh, it's got no access. Uh, water quality is marginally looked at um, in road gullies, et cetera, but that is it and it's met the standards. What the SAMs are gonna be looking for is sort of next generation. They're going to they're going to look at a system more, you know, akin to something on the right, where you've got this biodiversity uh, element to it. You've got variation in uh, the way the pond works in different rainfall events. You've got access to parts of it, perhaps. Um, you've got an amenity. Uh, may maybe that amenity is a as a wetland or uh, as as I suggested before, it, it could be just tree treescapes, urban landscape, rain gardens, etc. But the idea is to shift from the left image to the right image. Um, next slide. So I'll now hand back to Adrienne, who will then run through some of uh, Sirius tools um, that uh, can run alongside to help you um, answer some of these questions that the SAP will bring forward. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Chris. Great presentation. Um, all right. So if we can have the next slide, please. Okay, some tools are out there uh, for developers and to help answer many of the questions that we've been seeing in the chat box. The first one is uh, sustrain.org. So this is the community for sustainable drainage. And I'm mentioning it because there is a lot of good practice examples in there. 
So how to design a scheme with uh, multi-beneficial certs, um, the cost of those, um, and also all the existing guidance documents beyond Syria, all that can be accessed through the through searchrain.org. So I invite you to take a look at it. It's really uh, a source of uh, inspiration and a source of um, finding good examples that can fit your site pretty much. We also organize different events throughout the year, and uh, those events are really topic specific on uh, you know, an issue or challenge for the uh, construction industry in terms of sets. So we've had uh, a series of those in the past year, um, like a series on retrofit sets, which is also a hot topic. And uh, we try to make a good practice as visible as possible. Uh, and we do that through our SUDS awards. So we have those every year. Last year, we celebrated uh, SUDS Champions Awards. And this year, we're going to celebrate the Project Awards. So I invite you to take a look at the website for more, for more information on that. And uh, if you have a good scheme that you want to apply for, uh, do not hesitate. Next one, please. All right, as you can see here in the map, we have a lot of case studies throughout the uh, the country. So you can sort by the type of such features that were implemented during the uh, during the case study. And um, most of them will give you an indication of costs uh, for designing and installing these sets. The case study of the month is the Wallen Primary School Rainscape that you can see here. It's a little photo on the screen, I know, but it's a very beautiful scheme within the school, um, a school playground. Next one, please. This is a series of photos that we took two years ago when we had our SETS Awards ceremony in Sheffield. This is the, um, the Great to Green uh, scheme. It's uh, absolutely beautiful. Uh, it's within the urban landscape. A lot of retrofit went in there. A lot of, uh, yeah, a lot of flush roads you can see here. Small details on the bottom right corner, and uh, yeah, we had we had a great time discovering all the different elements of that and the planning that went beyond and the implementation. Next one, please. Now I want to spend a little bit of time on the sets manual. So this is our. Um, most comprehensive document that contains pretty much everything sets. It was published back in 2015, at least the last iteration. And there is a lot of information in there available for you that hopefully will help respond some of the questions that you have in the chat box. Next one, please. Um, the goals of the sets manual are really to support evolving legislation and guidance. Uh, to support those involved in approving and, and adopting sets, and uh, to encourage designers to maximize the benefits of sets, always trying to push for the multi-benefit aspect of those as much as possible. Um, it's really a one place for everything good practice that covers design, construction, and maintenance. And the goal is really to promote the cost effectiveness of such schemes. Um, and there was some questions around that on the chat box. Um, so there is a lot of information that, to try to, to convey that sets can be implemented and that uh, the cost of it is not necessarily much higher than conventional drainage. You can see that it is free for download on our website at syria.org. There is a little caveat here. I just want to mention that in February, we're going to have a handling charge for non Syria members. Um, it will be a small charge to support the uh, the hosting fees and the maintenance fees uh, for having uh, these documents online. Next one, please. The different sections here all apply for not only new, but also existing developments. And they cover everything from the planning, the design, the construction, and the maintenance. And it goes it goes into uh, very great details. Next slide, please. Um, this pyramid here, it's I, I just like that it shows you a little bit of the, the the level of the detail that can be found in the guide. And at the top of the pyramid here, you have the high level. Why should we do this? And um, this is all the the principles behind those. 
all the uh, the four pillars of sets what we're trying to achieve through uh, through good design of sets and that will be pretty much for everyone that has interest in it it will respond respond to most of the high level questions then uh, part b and c we are diving into a little bit more details and this is more for uh, decision making and for policy so it's a little bit more about the how um, and then the bottom of the pyramid here is really the uh, engineering details, like uh, really hardcore kind of, if I may say, uh, with all the uh, the calculation, the math behind it, the uh, flow rates, ratios, um, soils, components, everything that is needed for a uh, an engineering plan can be found over there. Next one, please. All right, the status of the sales manual, just FYI, so it has a huge impact. Uh, we had had, you know, we had more than 100,000 downloads since 2015 from many countries around the world, not only the UK. So it became a reference document, um, but many things have been moving since the last iteration. Of course, technology evolves, the knowledge evolves, experience evolves, and legislation. So as we've been talking about Schedule 3, um, and what to expect down the road, the search manual could use an update to reflect the new uh, principles and the new processes. So we are in the middle of fundraising for the search manual. And uh, we also did a scop scoping effort to highlight some of the sections that are in need of an update. You can see them here at the uh, bottom right. So some of the contact and drivers, of course, but also some hydraulics. Uh, we've had a lot of feedback on some of them that needs to be updated. The water quality, we've done some work and I, be, I will be talk about this a little bit later on in terms of um, uh, nutrients. Um, and then the biodiversity aspect of it, with biodiversity in game coming up, how to better integrate that with uh, such design. And then also, we wanted to recognize the evolution in the technology and how we have uh, more and more smart sets and how those could be better integrated within the guidance in the set level. Next one, please. A little bit of a, of a snapshot of the takeaways from the trainings that we offer at Syria. Uh, we have three trainings around the, the sets. So uh, it ranges from set 101 to inspections and um, it's uh, it's a very in-depth, uh, very interesting in-person training more and more, even though there's still uh, online options. But for example, some of the takeaways here uh, is that, you know, sets can be implemented into any building. There's always a solution um, through rainwater harvesting, uh, green, brown, blue roofs, disconnecting pipes from rain gardens, et cetera, et cetera. Next one, please. And also that there are uh, many opportunities on highways and in cityscape um, with the road schemes, pedestrian and cycle lanes, uh, parkings with permeable pavement, street planters, et cetera, et cetera. Next one, please. All right. I wanted to spend a little bit of time in um, talking about the natural flood management manual, which is a little bit of um, the counterpart of the search manual, but in a, a rural landscape. And just wanted to highlight that the goal of this is really to working with nature and when possible to protect the hydrological processes that, natu that uh, nature provides, if not to restore those or to mimic as much as possible existing or pre-existing uh, uh, flow and hydrological processes. Next one, please. It also has a different level of details that can be found um, with the uh, the why, starting with the why, the higher level questions, why do we want to do natural flood management, and then more uh, into the how to do it and how to deliver those, and then, of course, uh, case study is an example. Next one, please. You can see here the different type of interventions throughout the landscape in a rural environment. Um, and so the, these range from slowing the water and storing it as much as possible um, using, you know, leaky bar barriers, um, uh, leaky dams, 
and uh, swales and everything that can uh, slow it, store it, and uh, use it over there on site. Next one, please. Now, when we talked about water quality earlier, uh, we had a we published a series of guidance documents in uh, 2023 about reducing the nutrient impacts from surface water using SUDS. So we have one dedicated on nitrogen and another one on phosphorus. These are short documents, but um, they provide good practice guidance on how to use good practice SUDS actually to reduce the risk of uh, these pollutants from surface runoff. Next one, please. Another tool that is very useful for uh, making the case of going for a blue-green infrastructure or a search or natural flood management versus uh, the work as usual is the Syria Best. So we used to have this tool as a spreadsheet table back pre-pandemic, and we spent a lot of uh, a lot of time actually transforming it into a uh, very user-friendly online platform. And it has uh, a lot of, um, uh, the, the, the main interest of this tool is really to compare the monetary value of doing work as usual versus implementing a, uh, a CERT NFM or uh, blue green infrastructure. So basically you compare the cost and the estimated benefits and then in the end, it's, uh, it uses a structure process to provide you with monetary value out of the two scenarios. And that is really a decision helping uh, tool. It allows comparison, which means that if you have different schemes, then you can use the same methodology and then you will compare Apple with Apple, which is always very useful. Uh, the outputs can be downloaded, so you can plug them in into your case study reports, your business case, um, and it can demonstrate the multi-benefits of an existing project, and it relies on the most reliable published data. Uh, it has been heavily, heavily peer-reviewed, and um, so, yeah. Next one, please. Now, a little bit on the upcoming resources. So these are documents that are not completed yet, but we're working on those and hopefully with these will be published um, during, you know, at, 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 during the year. This one echoes a lot of the questions that we've heard, well, that, that I saw in, uh, the, um, in the chat box, which is trying to, um, to add studs elements as early as possible at the land acquisition or at the master planning phase. And the outputs of this project will really be a short document, a graphical guide to support early pre-design land development discussions and a two minutes animation uh, that will go along with it. So we really see it as a, a short list of key questions and pointers to make sure that multi-beneficial sets is taken into account at these very, very early stages, and then making sure that by doing so, uh, the multi-benefits of the set will be secured throughout the planning process, uh, you know, and later on implementation. Next one, please. Another one that we're working on is the asset management for blue-green infrastructure. And this is, again, about valuing uh, blue-green infrastructure, which includes SEPs and NFM measures. It's understanding the value that it has in existing asset management principles or looking at uh, adapting or creating new ones to make sure that we understand how much these uh, the, the value that they have in the long run. Blue-green infrastructures and SUDs do evolve differently than green infrastructures. We're talking about vegetated surfaces that can evolve over time, that have a seasonality, that are, uh, you know, that have different maintenance needs, pretty much, to deliver on the benefits that they can offer. And better understanding the value of those, as we do for green infrastructure, will help with the long-term maintenance uh, that those will need. So we're working on those uh, principles. And uh, 
we are hoping to publish this document uh, probably at the end of the 20th of, of the end of this year. Next one, please. All right, I think this is pretty much all I have. I just wanted to say that certs are great opportunities and um, hopefully the presentation that we gave, Chris and I, will uh, point you towards some useful resources and help respond uh, to some of the questions that you had before um, entering this webinar. There's a lot of question mark, as Chris mentioned, around the exact processes and timelines and you know everything that will be deployed with Schedule 3. So yeah, hopefully um, by then we will know more, of course we will, and that those documents and guidance will be of any use. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you very much, both Adrian and Chris. Um, and we're going to go to the chat. There's been a lot of questions asked in the chat. So um, if I could ask Adrian and Chris, they've both got their cameras switched on. That's great. And we'll go to some of the questions there. So to start with, one for Adrian, I think. Um, the question was, it, it's interesting that water is best kept on the surface. Are underground tanking, um, e.g. under roads, not op optimum? And on a one dig infrastructure basis, road infrastructure seems to provide easier opportunities to hold or slow the flow. Thank you for the question. Yes, this is really twofold. Um, the first one is about surface versus underground. Some of the sites uh, will need a, a little bit of both. So it's not uh, not all the sites will be able to keep all on surface. But what we're trying to promote is that the surface one are easier to maintain. So the cost down the road will be reduced because uh, the water will be basically there. there. There will be no need to dig further. But as I mentioned, some of the site constraints uh, will require a combination of surface and underground tanks. And uh, we have uh, there's a lot of uh, specifications around this um, this this mix of uh, type of sets within the sets manual. So I invite you to take a look at those. And there's you know uh, qualities to both surface and underground. Even though we would try to emphasize that the, um, the surface ones brings more in terms of multi functionalities and also has uh, easier ease of access and uh, maintenance for later on. Now, the second question was around highways and how those could be an opportunity for uh, sets. Yes, of course. So permeable pavement is probably the, the most uh, popular one that allows to use the highway realm as a, a filtration base and also storage capacity. So um, yeah, I would say, yeah, this is uh, definitely an opportunity to use. Brilliant. Thanks, Adrian. Uh, and for Chris, uh, planning conditions are likely to be a factor in SUD's long-term maintenance strategy. Um, would you see that being enforced by the, would it be enforced by the planning or uh, the SAB? One one of the key aspects, certainly the people that I've spoken to on both sides of, of the fence, is that um, there'll be a move away from conditioning drainage. Um, so the idea is that the, the SAB will take that role in that process so that there won't be a, a, con a condition um, that says along the lines of uh, you will then design your drainage in accordance with the FRA or whatever it is. Um, and because at the moment that's the one that opens up the doors to a completely different drainage solution to the one that was envisaged at concept site to site, uh, stage. So there will be it'd be a lot more rigid uh, right from the beginning that the concept design will be taken through. So you might see less conditions because it's going to be enshrined into the SAP process. Brilliant, thank you. Um, Adrian, um, it's expected that the to increase the cost of bringing forward new housing development or regeneration. And if so, are funds being made available to support these changes? Thank you for the question. Um, so the cost effectiveness of implementing CERT within new developments is something that uh, has been looked at a lot through case studies. And I would invite you to take a look at some of the documentation within the CERT manual that gives an indicated cost. And also a couple of years ago, we released a series of guidance with the Greater London Authority on sets for sector that looks at uh, some of the costs and uh, um, of implementing CERT versus traditional 
um, a drainage. So from what we found out is that the additional cost is, um, you know, th there's no, it's not always an additional cost, or if it is, it could be marginal. And all the life cycle of um, drainage maintenance have also uh, need to be taken into account when costing those. So it's, uh, as I mentioned, you know, installing something on the surface will be uh, less intensive and will be uh, less costly than underground, um, like underground pipes. And if something goes wrong, then um, the, the cost of intervention should be factored in as well. So, yeah, I would invite you to take a look at those. And also the uh, the Syria based tool that I mentioned could be a good one as well, because then we don't uh, we don't only look at the, the the benefits, the monetary benefits and value of um, the sets itself, but what it brings in terms of the other benefits, amenities, air quality, heat effect island, um, traffic calming, uh, education opportunities, et cetera, et cetera, the cost of the property. So all that uh, could be lumped in and give like an overall view of the, the real cost and what it would bring in the future of implementing sets within developments. Brilliant, thank you. Yeah, um, sorry, sorry, can I just add, add a little just... bit a bit on that on sort of from, from our experience and that um, my, my colleague uh, Andrew has been asking uh, answering some of the questions in the background. Um, he's actually been involved in a lot of the Welsh SAP um, approval process um, and I don't know if he can sort of uh, uh, alight on that but there's certainly some implications of commuted sums for instance and SABs and landscaping, BNG, those kind of things, which actually shapes the SUD solution and actually drives one solution away from others. I don't know if you can expand on that, Andrew. Sorry, I, I was busy typing away to one of the uh, the questions. Could you just repeat the, qu the question? Um, so yeah, uh, some of your experience on um, where SUD solutions are actually influenced a bit by the costs that so you mentioned yeah. in the past, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, you know, I think a large part of the problem with the, the new legislation coming in is trying to retrofit um, SEDS compliance solutions to existing master plans, allocations, etc. So the immediate uh, thought is to look at uh, those which should have the least amount of land take, for example, permeable paving as a solution, as a near surface solution. But when you then factor in the associated commuted sums over a 60 year lifespan, which uh, the, the SAB certainly in Wales seek, then, you know, the cost of you know replacing it every 20 years, i.e. the cost of building it three times, is uh, means that actually it's a more cost effective solution to look at some some land take uh, for roadside swales, perhaps, or basins. So it's, you know, there, there's a there's a huge raft of potential solutions for said schemes um, and it's just trying to pick your way through the most cost effective and, and uh, efficient. Sorry, are you going to go on to the next question, Fiona? Yeah, brilliant, thank you. Yeah, so if a local authority, this probably one's for you, Chris, to start off with, um, if a local authority has their own maintenance team and assuming there will be large sums for SABs to adopt, can the local authority maintain instead and keep as a private drainage on their own land for our, their own affordable housing developments? Um, in, in essence, um, they can do the maintenance, um, but the, the idea is that the SAB has a mandatory duty to adopt if the system is designed correctly, you know, in accordance with the design. So um, the idea of having uh, private networks is uh, kind of pushed into the long grass and it, and it should be by default adopted. OK, brilliant. And a sort of follow on question there um, that was also posed was, will the adoption of the SAB be included in a Section 30 agreement and will the local council collect the fees or is the SAB going to arrange for a separate agreement and fees with within the local council? It's it's going to be a separate entity. Um, and this is what I was sort of alluding to before, which was that um, a lot of Section 38 stuff sort of excludes um, suds uh, as part of it um because they're just going down straight down the design and manu design manual for roads and bridges type route um now this will work alongside um that process uh, and that's part of the legislation that defra are pushing forward thank you so um another one chris i think you're away what is there legally to prevent suds in in the highway being adopted 
uh, legally, it would only have to be land ownership or some kind of health and safety risk or something. But um, it should be adopted. Sure, uh, I, can, I, can't, I can't see any legal mechanism to not get it adopted. There might be some resistance from the uh, asset management people for because I've seen it before in highways where they don't like swales alongside carriageways, et cetera. Um, but I think we've got enough experience now that that's not an issue and it's not a reason for not um, putting suds in a road. Thank you. And then yeah, yourself again, Chris, um, aside from biodiversity and amenity, is the main purpose of the suds to divert surface water out of the wastewater network? Um, I think that's a bit more of a, a question back to the four pillars of, of suds, really. So that suds is all four of those things. It's it's quantity. So if it does take a quantity out of the network, then that increases capacity for the, the network downstream. It improves the quality um, and, and then it adds in the biodiversity and the, and the amenity. So um, they shouldn't really have any um, overriding factor it shouldn't, unless there's a specific situation where one thing has to be tackled above another. But they should all be given sort of equal weight, which the current situation doesn't tend to do. Brilliant, thank you. And then I think we've probably got time. There, there were lots of questions in the chat about the role of water companies. Um, so I guess there's probably to, to both of you any views in terms of what to clarify their role. Um, I kind of sort of hinted at it in that your new developments would be adopted on the surface water side, not the foul side, on the surface water side by the SAB. So you would have a development which would have no water company involvement in the surface water. Uh, within the site at all. Um, on the fringes of the site, it all depends on where that residual water, and we'll call it residual water because it isn't the total amount anymore. The residual water, where does that go to? If it goes to, to soak away or it goes to a water course, there's no reason for a water company to be involved at all. Uh, if it is into a receiving sewer or a combined sewer, because I think there was some chat about combined sewers uh, and whether the SAB would take those on, they remain water assets for water companies. So there'll be a connection. So the connection between the two will be an agreement between a SAB and the water company. So the water company would, in theory, lose revenue from the development, from the developers, from the uh, home homeowners in the water rates because they're not providing that into their network. Brilliant. Thank you, Chris. Um, probably time for maybe one more one more question. Um, um, what information will be required for the outline planning approval? Um, I, th I think again, I think Andrew's actually sort of done this quite a few times, so it may be one for him to answer. Sure. Yeah. Sure. I, I mean, it's um, it comes down to the the levels of risk that uh, people are comfortable with. So. You know, until the the SAB approval is um, is confirmed and signed off, then there's no guarantee that those works are deliverable and constructible. Um, but of course, you need an awful lot of detailed design information to to achieve that sign off. So it's it's not can, it's not likely to be available pre planning a pre planning stage. So what we are recommending and we're doing in most instances is carrying out pre application. Um, uh, contact with the SAB to try to establish the principles of the uh, of the said strategy so that then there's at least comfort then knowing that there's a set of uh, statutory design standards uh, following uh, Schedule 3 enactment that you can apply and then that should all follow through and um, adding the details should be almost a, a formality. Really, that, that's great. And I think that probably nicely brings us to the end of the question and answer session. Thank you very much for your time and thank you for your contributions, Adrian, Chris and Andrew. Thank you for um, helping answer those questions. And thank you very much for your time and joining us today. Thank you. Bye.